This is Cuphead. We all know Cuphead. We came here to talk about Cuphead. And this video is about Cuphead. Not the music, which is great, or the animation, which is fantastic, but the difficulty. And difficulty is hard to talk about, especially when it comes to Cuphead. There is a certain kind of culture that develops around games that are regarded as difficult, an almost counterintuitive mentality that forgives faults and excuses problematic design as part of the experience, part of the difficulty. Which is a real shame, because despite all the stuff Cuphead has going for it, it's also emblematic of a bunch of flaws that make it a perfect jumping off point for a discussion about what makes for bad difficulty in video games. And that is the subject of today's video. You do two things in Cuphead, you shoot and you dodge. This is the bread and butter. For most of the game, the shooting is just there, inoffensive. Certainly there are times that require positioning correctly for an angle, or choosing the right kind of attack for an encounter. But for the most part, when we talk about difficulty in Cuphead, we look to the movement and dodging side of the equation. Cuphead's main hazards are projectiles, lots of them. Some have behaviors that are simple as moving a line towards the player, but most have their own quirks and patterns that have to be learned in the chaos of a fight. Be it a lingering obstacle that follows the player around the stage, ghosts that wait then converge on the player, or even eyeballs that bounce off the ground. Basically, this means a lot of the game is keeping a distance from the boss and figuring out what it's going to throw at you. After all, in a game like Cuphead, distance is time. The more space between you and the boss, the more time you have to figure out how a given projectile behave. This is not a random process. Bosses have cues, animation tells, timings, a whole vocabulary of design language that helps this process along. For example, if a boss draws back an arrow with a bow, you can assume that the resulting projectile will move in a straight fashion, as opposed to looping aimlessly. If a boss's cheeks bulge, you can assume that there's going to be some kind of breath attack that will emerge from the mouth. And if a boss has a charging effect with a leading line, you can bet that some kind of beam attack is imminent. These tells are second nature to most gamers, little hints that players use to guide their actions. When this works, it's great. Players are rewarded for noticing and anticipating design cues. But when bosses fail to follow or create these expectations, attacks can feel nonsensical and random, and the resulting damage cheap and undeserved. Let's look at an example. On Baroness von Bonbon, the boss will intermittently attack by sending a bean along the floor, but there is never any indication from the boss that this will happen. The wind-up animation is simply non-existent. There is no spitting animation to release the bean, no pop-in or lead-in animation to suggest something spawning is imminent, no outline, no warning of any kind. The castle gates are even closed, strongly signaling that there is no reason to assume anything is going to come out of them. Instead, what we get is this. One frame there's nothing, the next frame, a bean exists. No bean, bean. Sure, once you know to look for it, it's easy enough to factor in and dodge. But first time players unfortunate enough to find themselves on the right side of the stage can find this attack spawning on top of them with no warning. Normally, this is where you could simply point the finger and call such players in way. But you can hardly blame players from getting hit when the game seems to go out of its way to fail to signal the attack. Here's another one. In Jimmy the Great's final phase, he creates three rotating pyramids with eyes that begin to circle the player. In this case, it's not that a wind-up animation is absent, but that it fails to signal what kind of attack is coming. Consider the details. There are four eyes per pyramid, so it makes sense that there are four lasers. But why do all of the lasers clearly come from just one eye? If the eyes of the pyramids are rotating on a horizontal axis, why are there even vertical lasers? Everything about the rotating eye pyramids suggests that the lasers will only attack along a horizontal vector. It's just confusing, and needlessly so. This kind of inconsistency isn't limited to boss attacks and animations. It's also present in other aspects of visual design. Consider colors. Red can be associated with splitting in two, homing towards a player, or even a motion sensor trigger. Yellow can be associated with fast speed, homing again, or even a slow looping motion. And black always means damage except for the one time it doesn't. The game simply lacks color consistency across different bosses. Most of the time, this is fine. But when many different types of projectiles are present at the same time, it becomes something that reduces the glance value of a screen. One less hint when parsing an attack for the first time. It's important to point out that this enters into contentious territory. As far as points go, color consistency is only more inherently arguable, more subjective. It's not wholly good or bad. So instead, let's look at where Cuphead does make use of color consistency and let the game speak for itself. 
For a cockpit does use color in exactly one unifying way that holds us a mechanical through line between bosses. Pink equals parry. In every single Boston Cuphead, you can be sure that if you see something pink, you can parry off it. In this fight, it lets you play slots. Here, it flips cards. And here, it allows you to escape a projectile. It is because the game uses this pink equals parry rule as a constant universal mechanic that the game feels comfortable building and subverting it across its many bosses. When Cuphead actually has a consistent mechanic, something it can twist and build on across boss encounters, the game shows itself capable of using it in a creative fashion. But unfortunately, pink equals parry is really the only place the game makes use of this kind of recurring mechanic. For the grand majority of the time, the game avoids recurring mechanics altogether. In fact, Cuphead goes even further. Not only does it avoid recurring mechanics between bosses, it also avoids recurring mechanics within the context of the very same boss. And this is because of the way Cuphead's bosses are designed. All of Cuphead's bosses follow a simple phase structure. Do enough damage to one phase of a boss, and after a brief transformation sequence, you take on the next. Repeat till boss runs out of phases and is dead. There's nothing inherently wrong with this. I've just described every boss that has ever had more than one uniform set of behaviors. But the thing about Cuphead is, minus artistic direction, the game's bosses don't really share a connecting thread between phases. More often than not, mechanics introduced in the first phase aren't amplified or carried over into the next phase. They just sort of vanish. An example should make this clear. Our subject, Wally Warbles, now forever to be referred to as Birdhouse. Let's look at this fight from the perspective of a player tackling this boss for the first time. Phase 1. Birdhouse attacks with an egg which splits in three after it hits an invisible wall behind you. It's the first instance of a projectile that interacts with the frame of the screen, but it's not a big deal. It's the start of the fight. You understand the mechanic and move on. There's also a line of birds that move across the stage, and one more attack where his head transforms into a glove and shoots three bullets. That's phase one. Three attacks, three separate mechanics. Then comes phase two. Birdhouse flaps and fills the screen with feathers. The line of birds are present again in phase two and behave in exactly the same way as before, but there's nothing else that carries over or extends from the first phase. No more splitting eggs, no more glove try shot. Artistically, you're still facing a bird thing, but there's not even a hint mechanically of those earlier attacks. To add insult to injury, the feather spam attack isn't even a unique mechanic to this particular boss. Dr. Cal's robot does the same thing, with an added bit of complexity in that the boss is actively moving while the player has to avoid barrier obstacles. These two sections, separated across bosses, have more of a connection than the actual phases we get in both Birdhouse and Dr. Cal's robot. They act as logical progressions of the same theme, the same projectile spam mechanic, and only serves to raise the question of why these two sections weren't part of a single unified boss focused on that exact theme. In fact, it really just underlines how disjointed the actual phases within these bosses truly are, which brings us to Birdhouse's third phase. The boss starts to move in a wavy motion back and forth across the screen. Occasionally, it shoots a single pink bullet at you, and this is where the eggs from phase 1 make a reappearance. They look mostly the same as before, except now they have spikes. But they don't behave like they did before. The eggs lose all of the characteristics assigned to them in the first phase. No splitting, no interaction with the edge of the stage. Instead, they just orbit the central boss. They simply function as obstacles. Same visual design, entirely different mechanic. Then, there's the final phase. The boss now lingers below the player, moving left and right. There are blue birds on either side of the boss's stretcher that spit pills that split towards the player. Sometimes the bird's head transforms into a trash can that shoots in arcs, and sometimes the head spits a heart straight up, which in turn spits three black beans. That's the end. First phase to last. Now, let's take a moment to unpack this. Think about the attacks experience in the first phase, then think about the last. Nothing about those early mechanics translates into the final parts of the boss. It's unrecognizable. It's basically an entirely different boss. Every phase is a new set of rules, sometimes even with contradictory signaling. The phases and attacks are so distinct that even after playing the preceding three phases, you can't predict anything about the final phase. Every rule learned up to that point, every attack and successive transformation, gives no information that helps you determine what's in store for the next phase. Simply put, you can't determine what's going to happen next based on what has happened before. You can't predict that garbage will shoot out from the boss's head in arcs. You can't predict that it's going to belch out a heart from its face. 
You can't predict how the heart is going to shoot at you. You can't predict how the pills will move through the air or how they will always split pointing towards the player. You can't ever actively determine what is coming and position yourself accordingly. All you can do is either accidentally dodge it or take damage the first time you see it happen. Then you memorize a new rule. Normally, this is where I'd qualify the statement. I talk about how an intrepid, skillful player could maximize distance from the boss to try and give themselves the most space and time possible to intuit and figure out these attacks the first time through. But almost all attacks make this frustrating or impossible with bad luck. The game robs the player of the predictive tools necessary to anticipate incoming attacks. There are no hints in building mechanics between phases. Animation tells alone are generally insufficient. They tend to act as weaker signals that serve to cue the player on successive runs rather than operating as any kind of meaningful hints for first encounters. Even a player savvy enough to notice a mouth on Birdhouse's heart projectile would be hard pressed to meaningfully guess what kind of attack is coming. Without hints and mechanics carrying over from preceding phases, it could be anything. This is Cuphead in a nutshell. Nonsensical attacks are presented, dealt with, and never picked up again. Players simply have to experience a new attack and catalog it in their heads for the duration of the boss encounter before abandoning it again. There's a lack of consistency, a lack of recurring or building mechanics. It's new rules every time. Every boss is fresh and unpredictable, with unique mechanics to piece together and learn. But problems occur when repeating this over and over again. For when you are fighting a boss that has multiple phases, and each and every one of those phases are entirely distinct with no carryover mechanics, then functionally what you are really fighting is several separate bosses in sequence. I think that this is something players intuitively understand as they play through the game. This is most obvious when looking at the more mini-boss type bosses, bosses that have phases in which the player has to defeat boss minions before moving on to the next phase. These mini-boss phases have their own set of mechanics and projectiles entirely distinct from the rest of the boss. It makes sense for this to be the case. But doesn't it feel familiar? Isn't it odd that this doesn't feel jarring or novel in the slightest? It shouldn't. Because this structure where the player learns entirely separate mini-boss mechanics for a single phase is exactly what you are doing in literally every other boss encounter anyways. Every phase, even those without the pretense of a mini-boss, is distinct from the rest of the boss in just this way. It exposes the fundamental truth of Cuphead. Every boss is just several separate bosses in sequence. Every boss is just a boss gauntlet with a new skin. This realization informs so many of the other issues in the game. When every boss functions as a mini-boss gauntlet, and the only unifying feature between phases is artistic direction, then you have a serious problem. Bosses start to lose a sense of differentiation. That is not to say that they all play out the same way, but rather that you get a sense that if you were to swap a phase of any particular boss with another, the end result would feel exactly the same. You would hardly notice a difference. This boss gauntlet structure also exacerbates every issue with nonsensical animations and attacks. Now. I want to take a moment here to point out that nonsensical animations are not absolute evils. In a very real way, they add to the charm of Cuphead's aesthetic. How else would we be treated to pyramid lasers, robot heart attacks, and tombstone headbutts? In many ways, these animations are what set Cuphead apart. It adds to the fun of it all. And it can work in the right context. In fact, it does work in the right context. When things like this happen at the start of fights, it's great. Resets are less costly and less aggravating the closer the player is to the start of an encounter. Beginnings of fights are great as low-stakes, low-consequence environments in which the player can learn the mechanics of a fight. There are times when you just sit back and chuckle at the fresh new zaniness the game brings out to kill you with. But this is only at the start of a fight, and Cuphead's bosses have multiple starts, a new beginning with each and every phase. When every phase is functionally a new boss, this advantage is lost. Worst of all is when a player is in the late phase of an encounter and a fresh, zany, new nonsensical attack better suited for the beginning of a fight is thrown at the player. Players are punished for failing to anticipate something that is unreasonable to predict. This is a problem that only exists because of the boss gauntlet nature of Cuphead. New phases become an exercise in frustration, as the player has to essentially learn an entirely new boss from scratch, with every loss pushing them all the way back to the start all the way back to an earlier phase that reinforces nothing about the new phase. If phases led into each other, with mechanics in the earlier phases being added to or made more challenging, then earlier phases would serve as direct practice to better prepare the player for the later phases.
As is, these boss gauntlet style bosses mean that players work through an entirely unrelated set of mechanics to get back to the phase in which they lost. Cuphead is a triathlon where if you mess up in the biking section, you are whisked all the way back to the beginning to start swimming again. And if it's the biking part that you're actually having trouble with, that can be frustrating. It's certainly more difficult that way, but it seems to miss the point of the challenge. You die in feather spam, you go back and work on your egg game. Usually in games, when you're presented with a fresh mechanic or concept, it is used later to build more complex interlocking challenges. Knowledge gained is part of a player's mastery of the game as a whole. Cuphead has none of the sense of building mechanics. If you note and catalog of a mechanic from a boss in Cuphead, it is almost never reincorporated, save for the pink equals parry rule discussed earlier. This is one of Cuphead's greatest failings, the thing that most makes every encounter feel the same or devoid of progress and differentiation. Without the game giving you a growing catalogue of mechanics, without being able to recognize and react to patterns you've observed and mastered through your time in the game, every fight is flattened, equalized. Functionally, you would be just as prepared for a boss in World 3 as in World 2. There is literally no information you'd be missing that would make that an unfair challenge as a player. Even within the context of the same boss, this kind of thing would do wonders for player experience and understanding. Take for instance Werner Wehrman. In this first section, he throws a bomb that splits into fire that travels along the floor. There is little to signal this, but once again, this is earlier in the fight, so teaching this kind of mechanic here is entirely acceptable. The game is showing you what to expect. Then, here in the final phase, we get these ghost mice that throw pink orbs at you that split on impact in exactly the same way as the bombs from earlier. So the question is, why weren't these pink bombs? There is no reason that these should not look like pink bombs to signal and warn the player of the impending fire projectiles on impact. All this does is blindside the player. Pink bombs will cue the player in. Bombs are a known quantity, a signal learned from earlier in the fight to notice and react to. Featureless pink orbs, on the other hand, signal nothing. There is no reason to assume that they will act like the bombs from before because, visually, they do not look like the bombs from before. The signal is lost. The potential to notice and react is taken away by this visual choice for no discernible reason, and it's just that kind of detail, that kind of little shift, that would do so much for giving the player just that little push of agency, a way to reward a player for noticing and putting to action a detail noticed earlier in the fight. And this is just in the context of a single encounter. If Cuphead expounded on this, if it grew its catalog of attacks and mechanics across bosses, in just the same way that pink equals parry was carried across bosses, well, then it could feel comfortable throwing them at you again. Bosses could expect you to have certain mechanics under your belt by the time you face them, making for more complex encounters as the player's game vocabulary grows. And now it becomes time to wrap things up. The final hurrah, the last bit before we tackle the why. So let's give the devil his due and talk about the most important boss in Cuphead. That purple suited shuckster. That cigar sucking, pip nose snake oil salesman, King Dice. The boss that embodies all things Cuphead. The boss that is Cuphead. A boss that is simply more. Not only a boss gauntlet, but a boss gauntlet to end all boss gauntlets. Not only loading screens, but two loading screens between every single phase. Not only retreading old phases, but inconsistent retreading if players follow the random health up incentives. And to top it all off, a finale with the mother of all untelegraphed attacks, where Diceman immediately smacks a hand on you with a ready that I can only read as sarcastic. A final phase that not only introduces the concept of mandatory multi parries, but multi parries with dashing thrown in the mix. Two attacks in the final phase, just waiting to send you all the way back to the start. But a boss that is also cuphead in all the best ways. A boss that is a triumphant montage of absolutely gorgeous art unique backgrounds, designs, and animations for each and every phase. A boss that is a veritable showcase of 90% of the creative uses of the pink parry mechanic in the game. A boss that, at the end of the day, made me most wistful for what could have been. For King Dice, it's harder than the preceding bosses, but it's harder because it is longer, because it only extends what was already there. If final bosses are supposed to be representative of the challenge put forth by a game, it's clear what Kappa considers to be difficulty. More phases to learn and internalize. More ground to retread in the event of failure. More room for error. Just more. More of the same. So, let's finish things off. We've been looking at the game under the frame of bad difficulty. At this point, it should be clear. 
that difficulty isn't subjective. I mean, it is to a certain extent, but I'd argue that it's only subjective to the degree in which it bothers or hampers a player, because bad difficulty isn't about difficulty at all, at least not the way we're talking about it. Bad difficulty isn't about how challenging the game is to the player, about how it might be tuned or balanced improperly. When we talk about bad difficulty, what we're really talking about is bad design. Choices that create friction and frustration that is at best adjacent to the central challenge presented by the game. And these decisions don't exist in a vacuum. They build and play off of each other. They become structural choices that have cascading consequences. A series of ambiguity and nonsensical signaling that culminates in a situation where every boss feels like a boss gauntlet. A situation where a lack of connection between phases means that players are unable to anticipate an attack when the hints provided. When there is no reasonable indication of how an attack will resolve, when there is little chance that a player dodges the initial attack from anything other than luck, then the game creates a lot of moments that simply require pre-knowledge to meaningfully tackle. Cuphead becomes a game of memorization, a game of learning cues, not anticipating them. Cuphead is Pavlov, and we learn to recognize the sound of its bells. At the end of the day, Cuphead shows itself to be a game of trial and error, of guess and check. Mm -hmm.